Okay. Cool. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. I think we have gone live now. Um, this is a recorded uh, meeting, so um, uh, just bear that in mind for your participation, uh, whether you are a panel panelist or whether you are part of the audience. But welcome. Um, everyone, this is our sort of this is our panel on uh, climate change and global voices. Uh, uh, my name is um, Andy Newsham, and I have the privilege today of, uh, of, of uh, presiding um, over this um, event. And I'm uh, really, uh, it's really great to be here um, with uh, these particular scholars. Uh, with that is with Philippe uh, Coulet, with um, with Faya Lesniewska, and with uh, with Tom. Uh, Tanner, because they are people whose uh, work and whose trajectories I really uh, hugely respect and admire. It's a huge honor to be uh, to be chairing them in this event. And they're a really big part of demonstrating this sort of strength and depth uh, of research that we have on climate change um, here at SOAS. So let me just explain a little bit about how this is, um, this is all going to work today. Um, we'll be having a sort of a set of uh, presentations of about sort of 10 minutes each, um, and this will be in alphabetical order of surname. So we'll start with Philippe Goulet, we'll move on to, to, to Faya, and then we'll, we'll finish off with Tom. Um, and what we'll do is we'll have all of their presentations. And in the meantime, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A um, box um, at the bottom. Um, so there's a, in the middle, there's a little Q&A icon uh, and you can put your your questions in there. Um, um, so um, then we will go and we'll go through those um, at the end, basically. Um, before the presenters uh, start, I just want to introduce them all. Um, um, and tell you a little bit about their work so that you you get a sense of, of, of what they're doing then i'll hand over to them and then we'll as i say come back at the end um, for questions um so to start off then with um philippe uh coulet uh, uh philippe someone that i i met uh, not long after i i, I joined uh, soas and i quickly learned not only that he works on environmental law uh, natural resources water sanitation and socioeconomic rights, but also that he's a pretty widely internationally recognized uh, scholar on environmental law, such as, as is, you know, um, sort of kind of demonstrated by his, his book uh, with Oxford University Press recently on the right to sanitation in India, and also being one of the editors to the Edward Elgar Research Handbook on <laughs> Law Environments in the Global South. So, if this is your bag, if you're interested in environmental law in the global south, we're really lucky here at SOAS to have, um, you know, a sort of world-beating expert in this field, and you really might want to get to know Philippe a little, a little better. So today he's going to be talking to us uh, about sort of climate, water, and socio-environmental crisis, and I'll hand over to him shortly. But before I do, I also want to say something um, about about Fea, who is um, a senior teaching fellow for CISD here at SOAS um, and she's also part of the School of Interdisciplinary uh, Studies and she works at University College London as a research fellow at the Science, Technology, Engineering uh, and Public Policy Department. So a lot of Faya's research, research has been around forests and law. Um, her PhD research was in China and was followed by postdoctoral research in West Africa, East Asia and Russia on forest related issues, including illegal timber trade, uh, community tenure rights and climate change, including um, Red Plus, uh, which is the reducing uh, emissions through avoided uh, deforestation and uh, forest uh, degradation uh, scheme, which has been going uh, since about the mid sort of uh, late 2000s. And she'll be talking to us today about getting uh, forest people's voices heard within climate change law and policy processes that ultimately impact uh, on their everyday lives and cultures in the context of Red Plus. And then last but by no means least, we have uh, Tom Tanner, um, who is the director for the Centre for Environment and Development Policy right now, and has worked extensively on climate change adaptation and resilience uh, and development for you know over uh, two decades now in policy-focused research. I uh, first met Tom 
at the uh, Institute of Development Studies. Uh, he was one of the key people who gave IDS a really strong profile in climate change and development before it really took off as a sort of central development issue. He subsequently led work on adaptation and resilience at ODI, the uh, Overseas Development Institute, another um, research policy focused sort of uh, uh, sort of think tank. Uh, and between these two gigs alone, you, basically, you'll probably come across his work if you do any reading uh, on climate change, adaptation, uh, resilience and development, um, either through his many research publications or through his co-authored textbook on climate change and development. So um, I think they're a really stellar panel here. I'm really interested to hear the, the presentations. And without further ado, I shall hand over to, to Philippe Coulet um, to tell us um, all about um, climate, water, and socio-environmental crisis. Okay. Um... Thank you very much. I see I can't start my video myself, so which means I probably also can't share my screen. Okay. No. okay. Um, thank you very very much for inviting me to this panel. It's a very difficult task of trying to um, summarize a set of ideas in 10 minutes. I'll try to do as well as I can. Um, essentially trying to look at climate change in the context of water. And the reason why I'm doing that is in terms of looking at some of the missing challenges from a global South perspective, which is the general uh, framework for what we are doing uh, here. Sorry. Um, okay, so my entry point into the debate and because I, I knew I was going to be the first one is very briefly on climate change before I move to the link with water. For all of us, climate change is an environmental issue, is a global environmental issue, specifically this global environmental issue that's informed by a scientific consensus. So the science, the natural, this science consensus at international level, level is very important in terms of the policy responses given. That's nothing very surprising in environmental law, but it still needs to be um, highlighted because it's not the social uh, or cultural dimension, but it's really the science that influences what happens. In practice, the, the crux of what happens in climate change is actually more centered around development policy uh, concerns. And that's reflected typically in the focus on greenhouse gas emissions, which is only a li limited entry point into the way we can look at climate change. The debates on climate change also are very much focused on carbon, no carbon options. Okay, obviously there is much more than that, but as a central point. And that gives us a limited entry point into the broader issues that we may want to look at in terms of climate change. Now, interestingly, maybe the, the pandemic we are in has given us a chance to relook at the way we are looking at things. And maybe the kind of panels we are having today is one way in which we can all contribute to making sure things are not the same by next year when we find ourselves on the other side of this problem. Um, okay, now, there is a lot which is missing in terms of what we have in existing climate um, policy. For instance, okay, maybe I'll simplify here in terms of the livelihood human rights dimension of climate change. It's something which is not part of the debates, but it's been very difficult and it remains very much uh, subsidiary. So in this context, there's one thing which stands out is the fact that the concerns which climate change brings to people may be different or are different for different people in the north and the south. It may also through within countries, but here I'm just using the north-south lens to look at this. And one practical example of this may be, for instance, the way in which the threat of sea level rise in two countries, which are significantly potentially affected, like Bangladesh and the Netherlands, will be different, just maybe because of the kind of resources each country has at its disposal in terms of managing the issue itself and the displacement that may arise out of it. So we, we've obviously come a long way from looking at it only through science and technological issues, but there is a lot which is still needs to be taken forward in terms of looking at the more soft dimension of climate change. Now, in the context of climate change, water is very much something which we can easily link 
with climate change because in fact it's also something which has local to global um, aspects uh, there is something called the global water cycle which is in a way equivalent to global environmental change which we look at when we look at uh, climate change now in terms of how these the different regimes concerning climate change and water look at the issues it's interesting that water is very comprehensive because it's been addressed for many decades if not centuries at the national level from the local to the national level depending on where and what at the trend boundary level, there is a little bit. At the global level, there is virtually nothing as of now. On the contrary, climate change is addressed mostly through a trend boundary lens. And while obviously by now it's also addressed at the national level, at the local level and so on, in terms of when we speak climate change language, very often it's the global dimension that, or the international dimension that comes first. Water is affected by climate change, is affected, for instance, by the changing weather patterns. The, and the reason why we're concerned is because most of the water, which is the subject of water regulation of fresh water, is rainfall and or is linked to rainfall, and hence rainfall is linked to changing water, is affected by changing water patterns. Now, on the whole, very in, as a very quick summary, water has been part of climate change debate obviously somewhere but it really has been remained subsidiary compared to the importance it actually has and to the links that we could make between climate change and water so there is something of a missing link now it may be in part because water is something which is much more important in social terms in countries of the global south and in the global north where things are more sorted in terms of for instance access to water and where water is less significant than input in terms of livelihoods, particularly if we think about irrigation as the primary, uh, sorry, ag agriculture as the primary livelihood in many countries for which irrigation in countries of the global south will be a very important dimension. So now moving to water in terms of water regulation, water is very much focused in one way and that's not the only dimension, but is very much focused in one way on its social dimensions, which we can identify, for instance, in terms of the focus on the human right to water, increasingly strong, but if not, at least in terms of the focus on drinking water as a primary policy uh, um, priority. Um, and beyond that, there is also the link between water and water as the source, as a necessary input in the realization of many other human rights including food, health, sanitation, and probably others as well. Now, at the international level, it's clear that uh, there is a distinction because in countries of the global south, water, again, is a primary policy concern and as well as a political concern. Governments fall for having messed up on particular issues of drinking water supply. Um, they don't fall on climate change policy um, issues because of the way they do, but in fact they don't know or we don't know because climate change is framed in much more technical terms, including at the national level in various countries, than in terms of the social policies that are affected or reflected. So for instance, one of the um, aspects here, for instance, is uh, displacement caused by climate change. Um, now, there are many issues which are common to both climate change and water. Both start from an environmental understanding. So that's one reason why water can come in this panel, for instance, very easily. Water, is, is sent, water policy is structured around the idea of scarcity, which itself is about the limited availability of water, climate change, we know as a global environmental threat. Interestingly, both focus more in practice and uh, in terms of policy on the development dimension of that they reflect than on the social aspect. So now I know I said that water was had a very strong social focus, more than climate change, but in practice, there is very much also a strong focus on the use and manage management of water. It's reflected, for instance, in that concept of efficiency of use of water which is at the root of a lot of water policy at present. Thirdly, both issues are framed around 
in terms of international consideration around individual sovereign interest of independent sovereign state. That's nothing unusual because that's the way international relations have been structured for centuries. But it's very strange in this context because we're talking about issues of global concern where we would expect that something else can happen. Now, there is an alternative principle that exists, which remains very controversial in certain circles, that principle of common heritage of humankind, which seeks to transcend the idea of sovereignty. One of the reasons why it's controversial is because it is still seen as being something that is more favorable to the South and also something that's more promoted by the South than by the North. So there is a lack of consensus here. And in the first place, at the end of the day, the climate change in the international climate change regime is something that was brought to the world by the global North to which the global South consented and became part. But there is a starting point of a different understanding of what the issue may be. Now, just to finish, I hopefully I'll be just within my time, more or less. Um, what is it that we can use water to help us rethink uh, climate change debate so that they reflect better the different types of interest at stake? One is to re recognize that both water and climate change are narrowly construed in terms of the much broader set of interests that they reflect in terms of the international legal regime. I'm not saying that otherwise they are not construed broadly. At the national level, it's clear that water, because it's much older and it has developed over time, and because it is understood as is being much more directly related to life, livelihood, much more basic in choose than climate change at present, can be, help, uh, can be of help in terms of broadening the remit of climate change in the way it's conceived, uh, particularly here at the national level. Thirdly, water being much more complex um, and uh, diff a much more difficult issue to address uh, in the global south because it reflects immediately on access to drinking water, which is life and death, livelihoods, um, irrigation, and more than and more than that. Uh, countries of the global south have a much broader experience in terms of understanding the complexity of the issue and of addressing it in different terms and water is one issue but in fact it's also many different split issues within that so like climate change it has many different dimensions to itself that can be um, better reflected in that sense one of the things we need to do is reflect on the fact that the needs of the global south sticking to that broad north um, dimension are not the same and needs to be differentiated in terms of the way we look at the issue in terms of policy development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe. Sorry, I was having a bit of trouble there unmuting myself there, but um, thank you very much for that. I think that really resonates with some of the key sort of concerns with the festival ideas about whose interests are di differentiated within the sorts of um, discourses and policy debates we have around particular issues such as climate change and water and, and whose are not, whose voices are heard within that, whose are not, and how can we leverage uh, different concepts um, such as uh, the principle of common heritage in opposition to hopefully transcending, as you say, Philippe, um, nation state sovereignty sort of uh, concerns around water, which of course we hear about much more, you know, the, the potential for water and conflict. Um, uh, these these all seem to me to be hugely germane to to the bigger sort of themes that are that are driving the whole um, festival ideas. So thank you very much for that. Um, as I say, we'll go next to Faya before we get on to questions. But what if you've got uh, thoughts in your head now about Philippe's um, presentation, just maybe stick them in the Q and A box, and we can come back to them sort of uh, at the end and, and and use that as a way to to structure our discussion uh, together. But now I will um, switch over to um, to Faya, who's going to talk about you know uh, uh, how to get different voices into forest related issues, particularly looking at the, uh, uh, the in the context of Red uh, Plus. So I'll mute and disappear and over to you Faya. Yeah. 
Okay, I can't open my video. Apparently, the presenter's going to do that. Uh, so, so, I think we should be able to get some technical help with that. Got my video. Okay, here we go. Hey. Uh, well, welcome to every, everybody. Uh, thanks to Andy and also thanks to Philippe for you know, laying out some of the very important uh, background but also conceptual framework, which within the context of water, some of those can equally be applied to the area of forest and land use. So as, uh, as Andy said, I'm going to speak to how forests have been um, framed and response measures to try and deal with uh, climate change in terms of both uh, mitigation and adaptation. The, policies that have been developed and the emphasis particularly on the inclusion of uh, forest peoples and people in the global south in those processes uh, how, whether it's been um, uh, sort of an afterthought and if it's been effective the participatory procedural process um, measures that have been put in place what I'd like to begin with firstly, of course, is that you know, the, the role of forests in climate change. Uh, first, and initially, we, we understand forests as a contributor to the problem of climate change through deforestation and degradation. Uh, we have now, we're at the point where we've, the world is 50% less forest than it had uh, 10,000 years ago. A large percentage of that loss has happened in the past 70 years. Every year we lose around 15 billion trees. Uh, and this is largely to clear land for uh, agro-industrial commodities, um, many of which uh, feed people in the global north rather than the global south. And, um, the emphasis on deforestation in some parts uh, is overplayed in regard to the responsibility of uh, forest peoples and forest communities. So you hear a lot about sort of slash and burn uh, by forest communities uh, and their, that, that impact on forests, uh, whereas the greatest uh, environmental footprint on forests comes from consumption and primarily from the global north. So when it comes to uh, reversing uh, the uh, emissions from forests, the plan is to firstly prevent further deforestation and to increase the area of forests. So that would be by afforestation and reforestation processes. The initial plans to do this is, is to somehow fund these processes through market-based mechanisms to value forests in ways that uh, they, through cost-benefit analysis, the value of a forest is greater than the value of a cleared area of land. Now, so the price has to be placed on the, uh, on the carbon in the forest. How you do that is really quite problematic. Uh, you need a buyer, um, but you also need the people who use forests to, uh, to agree to change the way in which they use forests. And this has been one of the issues with Red Plus. So I, if I just briefly introduce Red Plus. So Red Plus was uh, a mechanism incorporated into the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, negotiations in 2007. The idea with Red Plus was to reduce emissions from deforestation and degradation. By doing the, the proposal was to, as I say, to put a price on uh, emissions from deforestation and degradation. So if you reduced your emissions, um, you would you would be rewarded. It is what's known as a um, um, an offset mechanism. So those that want to offset their, uh, their emissions uh, in one country 
can buy emission reductions through good forest activity that's reducing emissions and sequestering more carbon in another part of the world. And this has equity issues, uh, as the majority of those that were looking to invest were in the global north, and those that would have to change the way that they use forests uh, would be in the global south. Now, my focus in this presentation is on not on the states, so not like uh, Brazil and Indonesia and countries in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, not on the states, but on the people in forests and how they would be impacted by this proposed mechanism, which of course they didn't propose, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a proposed policy measure that affects them, but they had no say in how it was developed. So a key part of uh, an inclusive approach was to place an emphasis on participation in the implementation of Red Plus. So like that's what I say, it's like an afterthought to include communities so that the communities would agree to um, do what was needed so that the Red Plus mechanism and uh, measures and projects would be effective. Now, as I said, the uh, Red Plus was incorporated in 2007, it was proposed, it was incorporated in 2008 in, a, in um, the Bali Action Plan. It sits firmly within the Paris Agreement in uh, Article 5 as a clear measure um, for uh, reducing emissions through nature-based solutions. So it, it's very much part of climate change uh, sort of toolkit um, on the land use and land use change um, uh, dimensions. What's happened since 2008 is very interesting. There's been uh, various types of Red Plus projects. There's been what's known as national level projects, private projects that are uh, just independent. Um, you know, it, it can include businesses, but also conservation organizations often investing, encouraging uh, portfolio investment in projects in countries in the global south. Many of these projects have been monitored uh, and uh, studied and researched. There's overwhelming evidence that the processes to include forest peoples have been um, poor at best and actually uh, very extremely damaging at worst. The, there has been a uh, reinforcement of patterns of relations between authorities uh, who govern forest lands in these countries that were established in the colonial period, where forest peoples were marginalized, discriminated against, and that discrimination comes through in the um, very superficial way in which many forest communities are um, invited into participatory processes, but they do not, uh, they, they are not uh, genuinely involved in the processes and the procedures often do not run through the time of the project. It's only at the beginning of the project. Uh, they may be invited to a meeting. Uh, and of course, when I use the word communities, it'll be a particular individual. And there are really serious issues about sort of marginalization of um, women and children, but also there's different communities are played off against each other. And, and this, this can cause conflict within communities of, uh, in, in forest lands. One of the points that I want to emphasize as well, that's, that's been increasingly apparent uh, in the past sort of 10, 10 years or so, as there's been an emphasis on giving more participatory rights to forest peoples, and, and, and this was really reinforced for indigenous peoples with the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, 
and the notion the principle of free prior informed consent. As there has been more um, uh, scope for this and, and uh, articulation of this, this, this right for participation in processes, there's been a pushback by more uh, authoritarian uh, governments. Now, one country I sort of flag up, and, and it's particularly in Latin America, we, we're seeing this, is where environmental human rights defenders who are defending land and trying to support forest communities have, uh, have seen high levels of intimidation, violence, and even, even death. Um, the, in, since uh, about 2012, I think it is, Global Witness has been working with uh, various organizations to report and document uh, the deaths and intimidation against uh, environmental human rights defenders. What we're seeing is that the space for participation and engagement is being increasingly uh, curtailed and people's uh, forest communities uh, options to engage um, are becoming more um, oh, what's the word? Um, more fragile that to engage you put your life on the line now this has come to the attention through the report but also through the work of the UN um, special reporter on environment and human rights this has come to the world's attention that human rights defenders, environmental human rights defenders, rights need to be secured. Um, a regional agreement on participation, uh, access to information and, and environmental justice was agreed in 2018 in the Latin America and Caribbean region uh, called the Escazo uh, Agreement. It's, uh, it includes, it's the first agreement to include environmental human rights defenders' rights and the obligation of parties to that agreement to uphold and advance those rights. And that does include, obviously, participation and engagement in any uh, forest-related uh, policy making. The, what's quite odd as what's starting to happen um, is that the countries that sponsored the agreement, Costa Rica and Chile, uh, Chile has now refused to sign the agreement um, and Costa Rica is questioning whether to sign it. It is nearly, uh, it's one party before it enters into force, but the What's concerning is that Latin America, many of the Latin American countries, including Brazil, have yet to sign the agreement and are showing, are indicating that they're concerned that by signing the Escazo agreement, that it may impact foreign direct investment, um, particularly in the agricultural sector, uh, where we're seeing sort of deforestation for, for uh, agricultural land conversion. What's promising in some ways, uh, given this sort of negative uh, development, is uh, we have seen just recently the European Commission uh, is supporting the mandatory requirement of uh, investors and businesses who um, work to, to ensure through their supply chains due, di due diligence that there is no environmental or human rights violations. Um, so that would include things like uh, importation of soy from Brazil, for example, and palm oil from Indonesia. So this could be a new avenue to support uh, the voices and the peoples in forest uh, dependent communities in the global south. But there is no doubt that uh, forest peoples, forest dependent peoples in the global south uh, are facing an extraordinarily hard time uh, in, in engaging uh, in um, climate change related forest law and policy processes where we're uh, at a time when we need 
their voices more than ever. Um, and uh, with people working in the global north, academics, NGOs, legal uh, organizations and governments need to support um, the legal initiatives to um, prevent environmental degradation uh, through supply chains, but also support the rights of um, environmental human rights defenders and, and encourage the governments that are um, uh, undermining those rights. So that's, uh, I would hand over, I think I probably went over my 10 minutes, but sorry. You did, but only, not, not by too much. Thank you very much, Faya. Um, that's uh, a hugely uh, interesting sort of update on um, the extent to which people, um, you know, are able to access the, the, the rights that notionally they, they actually have. Um, sorry, I need to start my video there. And um, that was, uh, so it was, you know, really great to get that, that, that update on, on where we are up to uh, with that. It's another sort of case of thinking through the political economy, if you like, of, of who gets to speak and who doesn't. So uh, thank you very much for that, Faya. We are, as I say, um, I can see we've got a couple of questions coming in. I will leave them to the end because first. Um, just want to hear from uh, Tom Tanner, who is going to be talking uh, to us about some of his work on uh, children in a changing uh, climate. Um, so Tom, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Hi, and uh, hello to all around the world, wherever you are. Um, I start this really from a position of thinking about COVID-19 um, and how it's been for you, but for me, it's been emotional. It's emotion's been at the forefront for me uh, personally, and I find it really fascinating that emotion isn't really dealt with enough when we're thinking about global voice, um, how we construct narratives, how we build solutions uh, and problems based on those narratives and how emotion really gets involved. And so I guess that's a starting point really for talking about children and climate change um, is that there's a great deal of emotion involved and the um, standard mode of engagement that you've probably experienced from the media around children and climate, particularly with regard to the global south, let's just leave the Greta effect to, to one side for a moment, is is around the kind of shock and awe. Um, I can share, you know, a couple of couple of classic headlines. Here you have um, the director, policy director of, say, the Children, the international INGO, um, saying that climate change is an existential threat, basically because it means you can't meet the targets to have every child, child in school, um, food, food secure, uh, and so on. Um, it's very much like an impact of climate on children, something that's done to them. Equally, the Lancet study uh, this year that looked at children effects on, on child health through the life course, it, it's effects on children of climate change. And there's this kind of shock and awe um, kind of tactic that that really that's the way it's uh, it's presented largely in the media and that's you know that has an emotional bent right it makes us think that children are vulnerable um it presents the a level of passivity that children are passive um and it presents them as victims and that's not just the media, so the research then follows those kind of narratives so that we look at research that projects the number of um, children who will be affected by disasters each year because of climate change is going to go up from 66 million per year in the 90s to, to 175, you know, 10 years later. And these things are used um, as campaigning tools, but they also shape the response. So they provide a paternalistic, protectionist uh, approach to the response that means we think about okay so what do we need to do to protect children from these events and particularly event by event so we look at um, child protection during disaster events we look at uh, the psychological uh, and physical health effects and uh, look at protection from abuse we look at the uh, the damage to uh, how to limit the damage to education and educational uh, attainment now as i say this is this leads this emotive response leads us into seeing passive victims who are vulnerable and need protecting and paternalistic. And it doesn't allow us to see children as actually 
having agency in their own right um, and think about how their voices around the world can be heard. Now, I, I assume everybody has heard of uh, Greta Thunberg and the Greta effect in stimulating child-led approaches to tackling climate change. And that is starting to change things, uh, but with some caveats, I would say. First of all, there is a global north uh, dominance to that narrative and that action. Um, but throughout the world, it tends to be you know, the, the, the richer classes, the uh, more educated classes that tend to be those who are speaking on behalf of other groups. Um, there is a significant amount of tokenism still as a response. So we see that uh, in the extreme where we have outright rejection of what they think, but actually those politicians who are sensible enough to, to realize they shouldn't just shout the children down, um, provide a level of tokenism, but there's you know, the evidence that there's actually feed, feed into uh, changing policies as a result um, is still limited. Um, and crucially for me, coming from um, a climate change adaptation, so looking at adapting to the impacts, how to be more resilient to disasters, to the changes in the future climate, um, and rather than the mitigation side, the, the, the predominant approach of that campaign has been to say there is a global injustice and we need to mitigate the problem. We need to reduce emissions around the world. And that's kind of only one half of the climate change and development coin, right? The other side is adapting to the impacts. And we know they're happening now, um, but how to reduce the, the impacts from those changes and how to adapt to those changes is much less worked on, despite it being a more immediate concern for many of the children around the world. And that's a, you know, from a global north, global south perspective as well, that's always been the consistent um, voice of countries from the global south and particularly from the small island states uh, and from the least developed countries groups and the Africa group. This is, we need action on the adapting, on adaptation to climate change uh, as much as we need attention to the mitigation of emissions. So, you know, things are changing, but I think not necessarily all, all in the right direction. Um, that said, I'm getting more positive because there is, um, in the international level now, there is an acceptance that there needs to be a balance between an adaptation response and a mitigation response. So crucially, we're seeing that in international negotiations, but also that that's um, at least an aspiration for the balance of funding. So greater equal levels of funding going to adapting to climate change and mitigating uh, emissions. Um, I'm also optimistic, I'm an optimistic guy, uh, that there are greater links into formal decision-making channels and the Greta effect and the work of thousands of, of other uh, groups of young people around the world are starting to have um, a greater impact in policy and to, to make those links both you know, at the, at the local level within communities up to national, national government, but also internationally. So we this next year's uh, big climate change meeting, which the UK is hosting uh, alongside Italy, they have a pre-COP meeting that's a big summit, youth summit happening in Italy. And for the first time, we see the linkages between the agenda items in the youth summit actually linking to agenda items in the, uh, the COP itself uh, when the countries come together to negotiate. And it remains to be seen if that does go beyond tokenism, but we have kind of a more structural basis for some of those links to be made for the first time, I think. Uh, so my research work is kind of linked into this change of narrative uh, to look at how children's groups in the global south um, can recognize and realize the potential uh, of children as agents of change. Um, and there's a growing global movement who are engaged on this. What we've... Uh, really come up with through, through, through uh, engaging with groups in Latin America, in Africa, in East Asia has been around that, that, that there are multiple ways that children can actually make a difference and engage. Um, probably useful to put it up as a mini slide. Let me share my screen again. So a very dry slide, sorry, don't like PowerPoint, but it's nice to have something to talk to sometimes. Um, so there are multiple ways that, that these children's groups are engaging. Um, and so you'll see, and I'm going to show a video clip um, in a little while that just shows you some of the, the filmmaking that we've um, been working on with these groups of, of 
children and young people that try and provide that analysis of what the problem is from the from the child centered perspective um, and it's been really instructive seeing the ability to do analysis to contextualize that that knowledge locally um, and using you know the analytical tools and to enable them to be able to have conversations and to prioritize action accordingly um, and you'll see a bit of that from from the film in the philippines um, but we also see them uh, these ch child groups as actual implementers as well and that's that was really fantastic uh, the work i was engaged with in latin america where there we had funding to give small grants to we i say this is plan international um had funding to give grants to, to to groups there and even with small amounts of money the children were able to um to prioritize uh use their own perceptions of risk have discussions with the local community and to prioritize action and what was fascinating of course is that coming not only as a as an outsider from outside that country and community and even the the plan staff coming from outside the community and even the um parents within the community seeing this risk perception as being really differentiated amongst the child centered groups uh, compared to elsewhere and having that using that as a way of debating what action should be take could take place so you know you might go into a very steep hillside uh, village in el salvador and say we know that uh, landslides have been a problem here, they block the river, they cause floods, um, and the children do all the risk assessment, risk analysis using the, the, the tools that are kind of trained them in, and they basically come up with, look, the big problem here is that every year kids are dying on this road. We have to cross this road. It's really busy. No one has any uh, ever stops. We have to cross this road to get to school. It's a major thoroughfare. It's really hard to cross it. Um, and see cars in time and so speed bumps is how we want to spend the money and so actually putting realizing that these perceptions of risk and what is prioritized is, is is really something that can come from from below and that you would never prioritize if you were coming in from outside and indeed with a with an adult centric view um we were also fascinated by the, the kind of modality of uh, children as advocates so uh, an another area in, in the Philippines we worked in uh, was had a lot of chromite mining uh, around the villages in eastern Samar and um, they did extensive lobbying uh, having investigated the problem um, the children did extensive lobbying both at the community level and uh, at the um, at the district level to the district governors to try and ban or to ban the uh, chromite mining that in the immediate vicinities of of the uh, of the villages and of course there's a an approximate cause just like um, Faya was alluding to here you know the reason why these chromat mines are there is because there's an international demand from china from the global north and that is you know it's very hard to 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 to, to, to take action against that but at least to advocate to stop the mining in the immediate vicinities of villages so you don't pollute the local water courses and um, so you limit the local levels of um of flooding uh, that result from the mining pits um, that was fascinating to see that advocacy in motion and, and using the videos like the one I'm going to show to be able to, to do that. Um, and then finally, just the communication tool and the use uh, the, the use of knowledge and risk perceptions uh, around climate impacts and actions to take um, to build that kind of credibility and trust. Um, and some work we did in, in, in Indonesia with filmmaking, we actually um, did a series, uh, a more um, quantitative study of people's perceptions before and after seeing film showings in communities in Indonesia to try and see actually the how perceptions of the credibility of children as um, action uh, of those who could actually take action could understand a problem could analyze it could prioritize could communicate could mobilize um, independent of the actions taken uh, and how those changed through this filmmaking and film screening process and seeing the acceptance that uh, the dawning realization that actually there's a this is a great body of um potential that the community has and that these young people actually can be brought to bear on making the, the, the community a better place was absolutely fascinating um, and you know charting that you know, academically but as well as seeing what the actions were themselves was uh, was fascinating so i promised you a video here's an, it's an extract from one of the videos 
made by um, one of the groups, the Young Hearts Media Correspondents, who are from uh, a barangay village called Kadian in Oras in Eastern Samar in the Philippines. And uh, hopefully with a bit of tech support, we can just get it to run for two and a half minutes. With sound, I hope. If the sound's not working, then uh, it does have subtitles, so. Paprungo gihapon ang buti pa'y tabo ang mga estudyante nga ang mga magturutdo. Let's kung pataasan ang aming paaralan. Kunta, tagan kami hin. Um, Tom, I have a sound, but not the video right now. Sorry, it's come back. Sorry. Kami, nagdesisyon kami nga uh, mabulig sa uh, ahira, eskwilaan, uh, one meter by five. Tara kay tidatong gadamaan amihan, nagkaurusan barangay council, nga maghimin hangin kabinit, o pod ang bulig, o pagkipagkaurusahan mga PTE officers. Kami, tangaran ha, PTE officers, handa kami bumulig, nga tanan. Nagplanong kihapon ang barangay council, nga maghimin proposal at on Department of Education, Office and Mayor, para makaaro yung pundo at pagpahimon doha kaanda ng classroom ngayon para gihapo ng mga libro nga nagkahulos. Ang pagbaha, isa nga dako ngayon pasigil na problema nga bisan ang mga tigurang di makakasabat in basta <coughs> Para ha amun, ngayong Hearts Media Correspondents, ang amun may bubuli ang pag-explicar ng posibleng ng mga solusyon. Asya ni ang amun na himo kontrahan ng mga problema na darahit baha ha amun edukasyon. Kung iyo kami bubuligan, mas madamok pa it ang may himo para makapag-aram kami ng maupay ng bigkas palang. Thanks very much uh, for getting that clip on. Fantastic. Um, so I hope that gives a kind of impression. I think just to square the circle at the end of the uh, of this talk, bringing it back to COVID, one of the things that I think um, I've been from an emotional point of view during uh, the uh, certainly the lockdown or the first lockdown, as it might potentially be now in the UK, uh, as we move into another one, was the community spirit and coming together that many of the uh, COVID experiences have brought. And it's something that we're looking into now in the context of these um, young people's groups working on climate change, the extent we're trying to track the extent to which there is um, a psychosocial benefit of taking action independent of the action actually being effective or, uh, or what it is, that actually the feeling of agency and not feeling a passive victim and being able to uh, you know, pull together is actually a really strong benefit and trying to quantify that and bring that into decision making that actually um, this thing, the, 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 these um, activities don't need to be just judged on whether they're having a certain impact or not, but actually that there is benefit in uh, engagement uh, and, and, uh, and advocacy and collectiveness um, in itself. So I shall leave it there. Thanks a lot. 
Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Um, that was really fascinating to see sort of, you know, especially with the, the video kind of uh, bringing it all together and, and, and again, really resonating with this theme of, of who's, whose voices do we hear, whose do we not hear, but also what's going on in terms of trying to amplify some voices and, and where does that really get us I suppose and you know sort of it, it, in terms of what kind of <laughs> implementations we might actually want to do depending on who we're listening to and um, you know some of these other benefits that Tom's talking around talking about around um, you know the, the feeling of you know coming together as a good thing in, in and of itself so um, I, again I think that resonates really well with the overall, overall sort of theme for the for the uh, the, the, the conference that we're, we're, we're at here, the Festival of Ideas. Um, so what we will do now then, um, we've got um, about 55 minutes left for uh, discussion. We already have um, some questions um, and we this is certainly the time for, for, for more to, to appear as well. Um, I've, I've got a couple here um, in the Q uh, and A. We've got five uh, questions here and we'll go through them sort of one by one. At the moment, we have uh, questions for, for Philippe and, and for Tom. So let's start with the questions for Philippe. I don't know if you can see these, Philippe, um, but uh, the first question to you is uh, that you mention water scarcity at the moment. Um, uh, and at the moment, our neighbor Cambodia has much flooding, rice dies if covered too long, and Cambodia may have lost um, a rice crop. So something here on the importance of uh, uh, of <laughs> water scarcity and, and relative water abundance, I suppose. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Uh, sure. In the few minutes I had, I didn't get a chance to <clears throat> go into those complexities. Um, that's actually one of the things I do when I, when I have to do a a full talk on water is to first highlight that the policy consensus is that everything has to be uh, looked at in terms of scarcity, but that in fact there are areas around, and that it's true that there are large parts of the world that are increasingly reading under increasing scarcity, but that at the same time there are parts of the world that are um, much more concerned with flooding on a yearly basis or on a regular basis than with scarcity. The, the issue with scarcity or in the, the, the underlying point with scarcity is that it's been used to push the commodification of water in terms of turning it into an economic good and in terms of adding pricing to water. So that comes in, that's where the, the development or management dimension comes in. And <clears throat> that's also why it's important. In fact, even in countries or in regions that suffer from overabundance of water at certain times of the year, because even in those parts of the world, or even sometimes even much more because of that, there will be an issue of scarcity, typically because the floods will have affected drinking water supply. And there, there will be a scarcity of drink of safe drinking water. So in those circumstances, the idea of scarcity comes back in because we are talking about safe water having become scarce, maybe because of the flooding. So in fact, it's a twin uh, twin loop. So yes, very much you're right with that comment. Uh, okay, and I can see the comment. Yeah, there's no one, if, if I may just read it out for people's benefit, if that's okay with you, Philippe, and then okay. ask you to answer yeah. it. Is that okay? I mean, probably people can see it, but just in case. Um, another comment from, from Inga Ralph here that's come in is about the, you know, thank you for highlighting the lack of global context and the common heritage principle, which I was also interested in. That was what my question was gonna be about, but allied to that is the global uh, commons. And is there a pathway you would suggest uh, as a sort of fast track for getting these principles used as a baseline for legal frameworks to protect the interdependent mega systems that maintain our climate and therefore human security, such as the poles, the oceans, the forests. The, the point here being, we also lack enforcement mechanisms and there is no time for lengthy negotiations. So how do we solve that then, Philippe? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not, a, that's not a two minute answer. <laughs> that's a few hours answer. Um, but okay, indeed, we, there is no time for lengthy negotiations, which is maybe what the Paris Agreement showed us in a sense. It took eight years to come to something which is far from satisfactory. Um, and by now the situation is even worse, which means that whatever was agreed on in 2015 is not enough, that much we know. 
one of the reasons why it's not enough, it's because the very basis for the agreement, which is that negotiating on the basis of sovereign interest is uh, ensuring that each state does what suits its own purposes, which as far as I'm concerned is very well reflected in that idea of nationally determined contributions, where we've moved from a system of negotiated commitments, which was what we had in the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, to a system where essentially everybody says, okay, whatever I'm willing to do is what I will do. And that's the end of it. So it's exactly the contrary of what you're uh, identifying. And indeed we have things which concern the global commons, which need to be understood, which needs to be addressed from, okay, I'll try to use another word, from the perspective of solidarity. And it is that solidarity, which not only has been missing, but the problem is at this point we're, we are moving backwards, if at all. So now we've come to a point, at least with some large countries, uh, particularly some large countries, not just them, but since they're predominant in the international system, that makes it more difficult, being not only unwilling to contribute, but also unwilling to even participate, that not only we need to move to a new basis ahead of sovereignty, but we also need to bring back those countries that are not even willing participant in the system we've had for the past uh, 50 years in terms of environmental law or whatever, a few hundred years otherwise, um, to that table because that interdependence has never been stronger. Okay, COVID shows it, what everything shows it. Uh, and at the same time, the direction of policy making is here in the other direction. So there are two things we need to do. One is to bring back states to where we were before maybe and then take us ahead. So indeed the challenge is huge. I don't, uh, neither in two minutes nor in two hours do I have the answer all by myself, but we have to think about that answer. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, it, it is quite, I find it quite difficult to, I, I like the idea of a common heritage principle, but the sort of, I don't know, stranglehold of, um, you know, sort of international regimes in, in, in international kind of, you know, negotiations and the sort of, as you say, the ascendancy of the sort of um, nation state interaction based on everyone looking after their own interests and, you know, the, sort of the, the advancement of that as a political, as a specific explicit foreign policy objective by by the United States right now, by Donald Trump is, is it makes me, you know, quite, it's, it's really hard to figure out how to get further towards a sort of um, a common heritage principle. But if I guess if you give up on the idea, then, then the, you know, then, then the, that's arguably, you know, sort of the, the you know, that's, that's not going to help. And it's arguably, you know, that's the, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it's also that, you know, if you just accept that the status quo can only be the way that it is, then, you know, that's part of the purpose of any status quo that wants to persist. So, you know, we have to challenge it, even if we can't figure out always how to how to change it. Um, but thank you for those for those uh, responses, Philippe. Um, a couple of questions that have come in for, for Tom. Ta for Tom. Um, Dr. Thomas Tanner, um, this is from Gionne. Um, how do we address um, the anxiety of children over climate change. I am 69 and even I feel it. And that links to your point there about emotion, I think, Tom. You're on mute. <laughs> T-shirt that says you're on mute. That's the classic Zoom T-shirt. Um, yeah, I don't have the perfect answer at all, but I don't know from my own experiences that um, the, the temptation to to live the life you, you want to live, to be part of the solution is important, but it's also limiting because that can lead to um, shame if you're, that you're not doing enough, but also can be dangerous that actually it's not enough, um, that individual responses, even collectively, aren't enough. To change, to, to make the changes uh, for a to, to limit non-dangerous climate change. So the lesson is, what can we do? Is to, is to inculcate within with children to encourage them that their actions matter, that they can individually and collectively help to change systems. And individually, that can be just communicating to an MP or you know anyone who holds power that you are interested in this and you will follow 
these greener uh, agendas, uh, whether that be through how you vote when you're legally able to, uh, or through influencing your pet, your household. Um, and then, you know, as you as you have a more collective response, you actually can start to change the, the systems that control decision making all the way up to, and someone's made the, the point, Catherine's made the point here in, in, the, in the comments that, you know, businesses are starting to realize that structurally, not only the kind of greenwash dimension that there, that there is a market to be had in environmental goods and services, but actually that climate change, dangerous climate change really poses a risk for many organizations and business activities. Um, and so they are structurally changing the way they work, whether it be in terms of their uh, environmental footprint or their levels of resilience to those shocks. And that's, you know, that again is something that you can push as a consumer or as a, you know, as a group of consumers to say, we, we want to see this, we will buy from companies that do this. And you've seen the more forward looking multinationals in particular, uh, positioning themselves to do that. Uh, people like Unilever, you know, around the whole world, they they see this forward market around sustainability um, in a very much longer term way than many others. Uh, and, you know, I think you can feed into that, uh, th those systems, even if it doesn't, it's much harder to feel your, your, own, your own impact to see a discrete change in, in the system. But actually, you know, we have, we have that potential through lobbying and collective action in particular. Okay, um, thank you for that, Tom. You've taken care of, of your two questions. May I suggest, by the way, that I don't think we're limited by bandwidth or anything or by getting in the way of each other's um, presentation slides now. Maybe if Philippe and Fair would like to turn their, um, at least their videos back on so that we can all at least sort of see each other. Um, I think that takes us through the questions that we had in the, in the chat box right now. I mean, I had one uh, actually, which was um, uh, for Fair, um, you know, it was really powerful to hear about sort of the, um, as you say, the very kind of afterthought character of, of participatory uh, mechanisms within within Red Plus. It's something that's decided at the global level. And then, oh, well, where have we got areas which have sort of got good forest cover? Oh, there happen to be indigenous people living there. Well, we'll just go and do stuff there rather than starting with the people who live there and which in, off, in, in many cases are actually for a, a higher level of sort of what we would call conservation value than you would get even in protected areas. That's the case in Brazil, for instance, as, as, as I'm sure that you you know, Faya. So, but my my question would be around in, in the research that you've done uh, in you know the different areas of the world that you've worked on is what has been the response from different indigenous peoples once they've found themselves you know bound up in these sort of afterthought mechanisms of, of participation what has been their response and has that have there been sort of attempts at processes of some sort of resistance or subversion has there been a level of capitulation has there been a sort of level of running away trying physically to get get away from the, the arrival of a, of a you know or, or a greater presence of a sort of you know set of dynamics and processes around you know um, kind of the expansion of, of capital sort of uh, accumulation frontiers or the presence of the state or whatever. What has been the response, uh, you know, that you've seen in, in the Red Plus kind of mechanisms from indigenous peoples? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I mean, it'd be no surprise that there's no single response. Um, and, you know, we casually use the term indigenous peoples when it refers to an almost variety of peoples, um, of cultures, of ways of living in the forest as well and, and working with forests. Um, you're absolutely right to point out the, um, that biodiversity rich areas where are the highest is generally where there's indigenous peoples are the greatest concentration. Um, in terms of responses with, in regard to Red Plus, you, you, you see a range of responses. Um, and that range of responses doesn't just depend on the, ind the indigenous peoples themselves, but it depends on the governance of forests within that uh, country as well. And the relationships uh, between the authorities and the government and the indigenous peoples and other forest users. So it, there's a historic dimension to this. And I think so sort of trying to bring this out a little bit more as well. Um, Brazil, for example, the tent, the, a, a huge tension is between the uh, the colonizers 
in Brazil who dominate the government, uh, who dominate the decisions around land use and land use conversion and, in, and indigenous communities. Um, there's a, about 50% of the indigenous communities in Brazil um, do not have contact with the outside world. So their engagement with this international process is, not, is nothing. Um, but there are some communities that see it as an opportunity to, um, to protect their, their, uh, the areas of the forest that they, they do have some degree of control over to prevent agricultural conversion. So, so they're trying to sort of find allies uh, beyond the Brazilian government. So there's, there's just general sort of political economy tactics working out here. Uh, so that's an example in Brazil. Um, there are different examples in sort of DRC, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, where there are real um, differences between the indigenous communities um, who have been in civil conflict with each other uh, as well. And, and this is another difficulty around the way in which we even articulate some of this, uh, some of the, the responses. It's, it, it's trying to understand what's going on on the ground and how that's playing out in international um, pilots and projects. Who's actually involved can actually play out really badly um, on the ground and lead to more conflicts. In, internally in, in a country. Um, so there's, there's that. I did want to come back and just to the point about um, businesses. Um, I may pick up a little bit about what Tom, Tom was saying about the forward looking um, multinational enterprises. Uh, that, there's quite a lot of research about sort of, they are for, they appear to be forward looking. Uh, it's the triple bottom line effect of, um, well, if we're gonna keep our business going, then we need to uh, source sustainable sustainably. Um, but again, this is uh, about them dictating the use of that land and the use of those forests without consultation working with communities. And, uh, and it's generally beyond the, the, the state and because most of these companies are, are in the global north, um, all those big, big companies in the global, uh, global south as well, in, in China and in Brazil, for example. Um, so there, the proposal by uh, the European Commission is, is very interesting about, well, you have to look at, on the whole, not just about sustainability, but about human rights abuses um, and how you determine what human rights abuses are. Because this is another thing, this is another issue is that what constitutes a human rights abuse in terms of environmental human rights defenders? And when we're talking about participation and when we're talking about um, access to information, the right to communication, if they're being curtailed, do, does a business have a due diligence not to invest in that country? So there, there are real questions there about when is it, when is somebody's right to communication being curtailed uh, and should a government, should a business not invest? How do you prove it? There's all sorts of legal dimensions to this. Uh, um, I don't know if Philippe want to come in on it. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's, Big questions. <laughs> if Tom wants to come uh, back, right, you leave her. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, do you want to come back on that? Well, the, 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 so the, also the, the interest of these big companies is not to change our habits. And uh, a big driver um, in terms of uh, land use and land use change in climate is to move away from the agricultural based diet that we in the West have basically moved to, which is one of the big drivers for agricultural land conversion. So planet, uh, uh, plant based mm. diets, changing what we eat, changing how we consume. Um, these are all, these all are 
somewhat threaten the, 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 the business model, even if it did go sustainable, it, whether that's possible. Mm, there's a big debate about whether you can um, continue to have, I guess, growth of some description uh, and square that with, um, you know, living w within, you know, what some people would call environmental limits. And, and it's very easy to talk about sustainability, but if if there is a, you know, it's it's also very difficult to 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 change that idea that that growth is something that might in itself, you know, needs to come um, to an end. And if that's something that's is, to what extent can you square that? I suppose with um, sort of, I guess, corporate social responsibility, really. And I mean, I don't know if any of uh, our people who are asking questions, Catherine, for example, who's been attending interesting webinars about the role of business and climate change uh, mitigation and feeling a bit more optimistic than maybe uh, the sort of uh, the reflections that Fair is sharing with some of the things that I've been saying. I don't know if you have a sort of a response uh, to this, Catherine. Please do feel feel uh, free to write to write more. I don't know if we have a way of getting you to speak directly, but. Um, there's a there's certainly uh you know a, a, a legitimate debate to be to, to be had there uh, absolutely um so uh we've got another question that's coming in the meantime from from uh Predrag. uh so an attempt to bring all three issues together which is very welcome um water and forests are deeply interconnected as the forests keep the small water cycle going and today's children will experience the consequence of today's uh inadequate conservation policies don't we need more awareness raising around, around these issues and linkages sorry uh, and concrete action to engage children and adults to reforest and rewild to plant the rivers of the future today what can we at SOAS do about this so um, I think that can be a question for all of our uh, panelists Philippe we've not heard for, for you from you for a while so if you want to come back in Okay, maybe I'll, I'll use that to also link with one uh, comment that came in the chat in the meantime, or <clears throat> a response that came in the chat in the meantime. I guess mm. awareness we need, and maybe uh, Tom will say more about awareness, but awareness should also be built with not just participation, but engagement from the ground up. And that, that's where the, the comment link that links, I links, links, sorry, I link that with the previous comment. That idea that it's the idea of looking at it at the international level, maybe a dead end in itself, because we know that states may never have the um, okay, many never show the willingness, never have the guts to actually do what it takes, which is to go beyond their own sovereign interest. And that's the only answer that can actually come is from the ground up. And indeed, okay, that's Greta Thunberg, or that's all the other movements that may be building up from the ground in terms of ensuring that government have to listen to what people who are affected by ongoing climate change and adaptation in the future will tell them that they have to do. There may be no other option and that needs to be done then in a context of stronger ecological democracy in the many parts of the world where there isn't enough of that. So that needs to be claimed. In other words, it's not just there, it needs to be claimed. Um, and that may also link with okay the other discussion you were just having now, the fact that it may be impossible to reach where we need to reach unless we manage to move ahead of development, whether it's called degrowth, whether it's called something else, um, is another question. But it may well be that as long as we're within the current paradigm, we will get stuck at the same kind of loops where we've gotten stuck or stuck over the past uh, at least 25 years kind of during the period of the Kyoto Protocol up to today. Okay. Sorry, thank you for the suggestion, Fair. Um, uh, do you want to comment on that, Fair, and then we'll come to Tom? I mean, certainly the, uh, essentially it's a recognition of sort of ecosystems that we live within ecosystems, uh, multiple ecosystems. Um, so we can talk about uh, more water-based ecosystems and we can talk about forest ecosystems, but they, they will, obviously there'll be some interlinkages. 
when you have a river going through, when you have a, a forest near a wetland. Um, and these just variations of ecosystems and how reliant we are on them. I mean, I think <clears throat> something that um, is very, very difficult for policy and lawmakers and, and politicians more generally is to appreciate how little we do actually understand the world that we live in, uh, in that we depend on. Uh, and the idea that we can somehow manage and control it and move to um, a, a, a good Anthropocene, a good future um, through our interventions, uh, it, it demonstrates the arrogance of um, the, the, the human era that we're in. Um, and certainly, and I mean, this is coming through in what we're saying is it's a more ecological legal um, jurisprudence, where, where is a sort of humility and recognition that more attention is needed in the way in which we construct uh, our normative frameworks, our, our rules in deference to, to to the natural world, to the environment, and that we are part of many other species. This is integral, that we can't just keep taking and taking and taking to sustain multinational enterprises, to sustain rich elite um, lifestyles in, in the global north and in the global south, um, and that a day of reckoning is upon us, and that if we don't, if we don't shift um, now, it will be forced on us. And it will be forced on us in different ways in different parts of the world. And many people will suffer inordinately because of the actions of certain people. But everybody will be impacted. Um, and I, I think that's really important to sort of bear in mind that we are, are all are impacted. Our immediate attention should be in um, reinforcing and increasing the resilience of ecosystems because we rely on the healthy functioning of ecosystems, not ecosystem services uh, so that we can exchange them um, in a commodified uh, trading system, but as systems within which we uh, live as other species. And, and, and this will require an enormous transformation in um, how law and policy is thought about and framed and stuff. But there are definitely indications that that's starting to inform some people. And I think the radical shift, um, radical shifts happen quite quickly sometimes. Uh, and I think we are in a moment where there is a, a, a whirlwind of transformation and within the next 10 to 20 years. Whirlwind of transformation indeed. So um, uh, I don't know how, uh, As a, again, I'd sort of be interested to hear what Catherine thinks of that. And I was hoping to then uh, put this over to Tom, who has now reappeared right at the, at the right time, because I wanted A, to get you to, back into the, you know, the question that we started with, um, to get you know the, the one from from Pradrag, um, what can we do about the um, to rewild to plant the rivers of the future today? And, and all uh, you may not have heard everything that Fayel was just saying, but I thought we might tally that with the question uh, or the observation from Catherine um, that um, it's an exciting time to bring the business world on board. You know, as, as you said, Tom Unilever are making this a big thing, and the Rathbones are really reinventing themselves. On ethical investment, um, uh, the the challenge, uh, as with Greta, is to change the nature of the dialogue and make it essential to engage with business and industrial communities in the in the discussions. So often they are seen as the baddies. So that's almost the counterpoint uh, in some ways to what you are are saying, Fair. And it's there's something here about recognizing the the potential. I wonder if that chimes with uh, you know the point you were making, Tom, about Unilever. <laughs> Yeah, I've lost the, unfortunately, having dropped out, I've now lost the chat. Um, oh, no. It's been said, <laughs> right. it's very annoying. It's reset, it's reset the chat. Um, yeah. Th th there is a lot that comes down to uh, personal beliefs around how the world works and how to make a change in that world. And there's a lot of distrust around um, 
the existing systems and the capitalist structures, the business community, because it is so focused on short term extraction of surplus of, of natural natural capital surplus for pursuit of profit um, with scant regard for real longer term sustainability. So that's you know, whether you believe that you can incrementally adjust those systems or even transform them um, from within or whether we need a radical, you know, more revolutionary approach um, is, I, you know, is still hotly contested. And from a, from a kind of young person perspective, it's difficult to hear that, that on the ground that, that, that there's a, a real sense of kids recognizing that things haven't changed and there's been 20 years for the kind of incremental change that's needed and that's been what's been promised and now they are realizing as they you know become adults that actually that that change isn't sufficient and that change isn't fast enough and some some different mo some different mode is needed um and as you know as systems do they uh, they mobilize to to put down the threat and we see that happening uh, around the world with you know, those, those threats being disregarded or being um, given, as I say, tokenistic uh, attention. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, I mean, that's still, that's, that's really hot within the politics of the world is how, we, whether we see this as something that needs um, revolution uh, and a completely radically different approach to organizing ourselves on the planet. So, Tom, let me bring this back to um, a question from from uh, Rubina, which I think is sort of uh, I think your answer, you know, what you've just been saying now about you know, it's hard to know what, what is that we need to do and what is possible. Is is there this is the you know this is one of the big questions for us here at SOAS is how do we bring change about and what is required to do that? And there isn't an agreement on whether it's you know a sort of radically sort of reformed um and, and rapidly reformed you know but still ultimately capitalist system or, what, or whether it's something else but and and you know your answer to that just now acknowledges that tom and bringing in uh, rubinar's question I, I you know that she says that i don't think individuals going through the current political legal or commercial systems who have brought us to this point is remotely the way to change uh, with the urgency needed. That's a bit more on, on the side that Fayo has uh, uh, been arguing. That there is no such thing as a forward-looking uh, multinational. This is a quite different perspective than that offered, offered in our chat by, by Catherine. Uh, Fayo is right, it requires a tailored negotiation to set aside. So my question, to, you know, to add to, to what Ruben is saying here, my question to you, Tom, would be in terms of when you, uh, I really, it's been really beautiful in some ways to, to look at the work that you've been doing with children uh, and to make these careful points about making this space in which children can actually be heard and listening to um, for them, uh, um, how do you then feel about sort of what spaces there are for children to sort of to voice? Um, you know their their desires and their 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 requests, their demands for change. In you know in in um in in, in does that make sense as a question, Tom? Sort of. Although, although you were fading in and out, it was your turn to have internet, internet problems, uh, connection problems. <laughs> Would you <laughs> um, like me to repeat that? No, I, I I think the point is worth making is that is to accept, and the whole point of um the SOAS Festival ideas really is to accept that we are not experts who have all the answers. Um, what my research is, is really showing me is that actually providing the spaces for um, the agency of young people is absolutely vital because it's not about driving that agenda, it's providing the space. For us, it was things like providing the tools, providing the you know, video, video editing skills, um, teaching them how to edit videos themselves rather than doing it externally. Um, and about yeah, that's that that's part of the of the process if we want to affect change as, as academics is to provide some knowledge to provide an, you know analytical skills but also to provide the spaces uh, for people to be able to to take action um and yeah maybe you know maybe i'm more of an incrementalist than than, than greta <laughs> and um but i think it's it is about like creating that dialogue creating the space um 
for the for those changes to happen and yeah and promoting the the, the bare facts i guess we, we're still talking about being led by the science in, in covid but not so much in climate that the science is telling us that we're not acting fast enough that the the, the impacts we can expect um even in the best case scenario is a pretty se severe to to to, to, to the, the both the the system on which we depend and the uh, and the, and the ecological foundations of, of our lives so that's you know that's what i think we can add in a way is to create the spaces and to create some of that you know um, foundational knowledge sorry near mouse failure to unmute um so <laughs> Which I think brings us a little bit sort of closer to a further um, quite, uh, observation that's been made by by Catherine. I mean, it, which is, uh, and I'm really glad that you're here, Catherine, because um, you know you have a quite different perspective than some of us here at, at, at SOAS. And, and I, I, don't, I wonder who we sometimes speak to. Maybe I'm being a bit disrespectful. Maybe I'm just assuming that we we don't reach out to. To, to, to some of the people that we could, but your your point, Catherine, is that in this academic milieu, bridges need to be built between academia, academia and business, and it's just possible that in this virtual world we all now inhabit that that might be um, a bit easier. So maybe that's a question, sort of, um, for all of us. It's quite a different perspective from the, from that offered by uh, uh, Ruben, who I've I've noticed your question got your your observation got split into two. Uh, so just to read the whole thing. Um, or the, the second part of it rather, Faya is right, um, it requires, I mean, change requires a tailored negotiation to set aside protected areas and make it worthwhile through ecotourism. So uh, there's a question raised here, which might be uh, best for Faya to answer, um, or the other chip in if you know, of course, is uh, in Brazil, what is the balance between deforestation by the timber and the agricultural industries? Uh, well, obviously balance is a sort of relative term, uh, balance for who, uh, balance of what, I mean, we could say, again, if we just go back to what I was saying about like um, placing at the forefront, the, the importance being ecosystems and resilient ecosystems. Think of, thinking of them in a transboundary sense as well. So if you think about the Amazon, it's not just Brazil, it's, it's transboundary. It, it, it includes a number of countries in the region. So in terms of balance, one of the, one of the dictating factors for Brazil as a, as a state for balance is, uh, is a, an economic model, which is, which is tailored around extractive industries and it's not just um, it's not just deforestation for um, uh, agricultural commodities it's also mining uh, so that's that's a large area of mining and conversion for highways and uh, and dams so the balance is a question of a balance either to destroy a, some part of the uh, ecosystem so that part of the Brazilian government and the people living outside the forest, the metropolitan elite and those in the in the south of Brazil can increase their um, income, their livelihoods. So it, who bears the burden? in that sense, and that would be forest peoples as well as biodiversity. Is it a balance that also includes those that consume and rely on the production of uh, commodities from Brazil? So where does the balance lie for them? Is the balance in ensuring that whatever comes out of Brazil is sustainable uh, when they consume it? Or do we move to a different balance in terms of our consumption? Um, there's also questions about balance of the life cycle of our consumption patterns over what period of time. So one thing that we haven't mentioned or discussed very much is waste in the cycle of uh, um, 
policy measures to address climate change. Uh, so sort of the idea of a circular economy, one that reduces the carbon intensity within the economy, uh, but also over time. So that would require a real transformation in, um, in uh, the balance of materiality of economy and how a country would um, be part of that. So Brazil's balance now is a balance of producing uh, agro commodities or keeping the forest. But if we have a different model of balance, it would it could respond differently. So the question of the balance that's posed is one in the in the moment that we're in, rather than be thinking creatively about an alternative way in which balances could be achieved to meet uh, different stakeholders' um, interests. Right. Okay. So um, <laughs> yes, uh, balance is, is not that, a word that we can take for granted. Not an easy, not an e well, I wouldn't say it was an easy, uh, <laughs> easy answer to, but I think sometimes when we're asked questions about, is it this or that? And you just say, we just need to reduce a little bit of this and a little bit. We need to move away from that kind of way of thinking. We need to think that there's space for creative solutions to finding balances of interests, but we can't do it using the same options. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So you, you're, I think um, that you, there's something about, if regard, even almost regardless of whether it's an incrementalist or a more revolutionary approach, there's something about, um, it's, you know, or a reformist as opposed to revolutionary approach. There's something about not just uh, thinking it can be a, a, a relatively piecemeal um, sort of response that we can get by with sticking plasters and making, you know, fairly modest changes to what we do and how we, we live. There's something much more fundamentally systemic that we have to that we have to think through. Uh, just on that note. Um, that because there have been a couple of questions about um, uh, uh, about um, what how do we do conservation? I just thought I'd throw in a little resource here. Um, you know, the, the, there was uh, Inga's uh, com uh, question to Philippa uh, originally, Pradrag's uh, uh, question um, about sort of you know rewilding. Um, and, and reforesting. There, there is also a big literature which critiques the ways in which conservation works and um, who is included and who isn't included uh, within that and the extent to which conservation itself really challenges the, the underlying drivers of, of global environmental change. You know, and establishing a protected area in Madagascar using the proceeds of Rio Tinto mining activities uh, for ilmenite, which is one of those um, ingredients in quite a lot of our uh, electrical goods, is arguably perpetuating a, you know, a sort of a system of, of, of consumption um, for the sake of being able to sort of have a, a a more uh, a better resource you know you know set of protected areas in madagascar it's 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 something that we need to think about our, con our conservation and how we're doing that as well and some of the people who've been trying to do that i mean not sure exactly how robust we we might find their interventions or their their suggestions right now but there's a and as an organization called Convivial Conservation, I'm just putting in the chat right now for people to, to check out by themselves who are trying to think about, you know, how we do conservation in a, in a, a way which is, you know, picking up Faye's point, maybe, maybe a bit more sort of fundamentally different, whether that's in reformist character, you know, the objective overall is to have some really substantial change. And whether you get there through reform or revolution, you know, it's not to say that, um, it, it's what you can't do is is just change things a little bit. Um, so um, to look at the comments that have come in, in the meantime, Catherine completely agrees with Tom's um, answer um, on you know these questions of of how to bring about change and and, and where children sit within that. Um, 
completely agree with Tom on that, but Build Back Better is the song of the time. Um, and then uh, Jone says, listening to the discussion, to me, it's the capitalist system that is the problem. Uh, please comment. I think we have been talking about that um, uh, a bit, but uh, to make it explicit, uh, if, if we could do a sort of round robin um, on that, a few thoughts uh, on um, the capitalist system itself uh, from all of you. Uh, maybe we'll start with Philippe because we haven't heard from you for a while. Um, uh, and then we'll see where we are time-wise and whether we whether we wrap up or whether there's time for uh, one more question. Philippe? Okay, but I guess, I guess I'll go back to what I was trying to present at first is that whether it's capitalist or not, it's a mod, the model of development that we've been following. So in that sense, very much sustainable development is probably at the center of the problems we are facing. And because in that sense, because it has not proved to be sustainable over the past 33 years, if we assume 1987 as a starting point for the era of sustainable development. And that's probably where, just in terms of concepts, we need to move ahead of where we are so that we can start rethinking things differently. And I was just, okay, linking that with what you were saying before, I was actually just about to, of what Faye was saying before. I was just thinking in terms of linking it to COVID and since it's present day thing, one of the things that has collapsed in front of us is the tourism industry. The tourism industry has been one of these problematic industries from an environmental climate change and many other perspectives. So it's collapsed from a certain point of view, it's great. If you want to look at it in terms of climate change. From another point of view, it's catastrophic because there are millions of livelihoods, jobs, and other things which depend entirely on tourism. We can't just cut it off. As in, if that's what we're doing now, then the consequences will be dramatic for millions of people. That's not what we want from a social and other perspective. So envir environment is one side, the economic dimension is another side, the need for change is one. That doesn't mean that we throw everything out at the same time because we'll create an additional set of problems. Um, that's exactly what we've seen happening during the lockdown with lots of people around the world being thrown into deeper poverty out of the consequences of the public health induced lockdown. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Philippe. Uh, Tom? I'm not sure um, if I have much to much to comment on that really um i'm i'm minded and with you that there is a lot of uh, the kind of uh, greenwashing of sustainability including in conservation areas and um the rewilding projects and, and the critical thing i always come back to is always the the need for longer term horizons and incentive structures and that for me implies you know a role for government and regulation um, that incentivizes and even, you know, makes illegal short term is process approaches that um, that prey on the uh, on the natural resources in the short term, um, without any incentive to, uh, to leave them for the longer term. And that seems to me, one of the kind of structural misdirections that we have in the world at the moment, that we need to address and isn't probably isn't being talked about enough, um, certainly in the policy circles that count. Thank you, Tom. Um, and Faya, over to you, your thoughts on the capitalist system. <laughs> oh, <okay>. In eight minutes. <laughs> in eight minutes. <laughs> Ultimately, I mean, I, I, I agree with my colleagues, um, it's it's more of it, it's a it's a model of uh, extraction uh, and a model of life livelihood and a model of development um, uh, and ways of meeting those models of development. Um, ultimately, it, value has not been placed where it needs to be placed. Uh, things have been determined as of no value um, but they are of high value and we're only we're beginning to recognize that I mean through ecological economics 
um, beginning, you know, placing value on uh, the cost of the loss of uh, ecosystem services, also the cost of pollution. Uh, so incorporating that into the uh, production costs and that th that cost should be reflected in the pricing of goods um, that are consumed. Uh, there's, there, is, there is a great deal to be said. I mean, we're seeing it with the sort of move to economic and social governance um, uh, accounting systems. Uh, there's this new sort of field in impact investment, um, recognizing the full cost accounting of investment and, and then the production uh, of commodities. And that pricing should be done in that way. That would transform the way in which we consume, it would transform the way in which we invest, transform the way in which we produce. Um, so there are, there are ultimately economics can assist if we have the right rules, the right interventions, the right regulations to mobilize and value appropriately. Whether you call that capitalism, it's up to you, I think, like, because I think you, you completely alienate people as, as soon as you say, well, we need to get rid of capitalism and bring in something else. So we need to value in a different way. We need the rules to do so. We need the regulatory instruments to enable that. Um, and we need to respect people to be part of the process to make that happen. One point that I really want to just underscore that I think that Tom made uh, about engaging people to enable them to deal with the anxiety of crisis and the moving away from the sense that it's an inevitable victimhood. Um, I think there's a loss of value of people if you're not engaging and bringing them into, into the processes of change. Um, so in terms of a straight answer to the capitalist system, don't get, I'm not gonna give one, uh, but I think the key thing is, is about where we place value and then how we build uh, a, our governance systems around that. Mm, and perhaps that's the point uh, which we could sort of all uh, agree on because there might be a role for, you know, um, organisations in the private and the public sectors and, and organisations which don't fall into that categorization to be part of that conversation uh, around value. Presuming that this is the conversation that we all agree we need to hear and that we have the right voices sort of, uh, or the right, we have enough, whatever that means, uh, voices contributing to um, the conversation. Um, so I think we it's kind of um, time for us to draw this to a close because we have the next um, uh, session uh, which uh, is about to start uh, after us. That session um, is called uh, Duress and vir Virality, or Virality, the Endurance of Racial Capitalism. That's happening from 3 till 5 p.m. So in order to help people get set up, I think we should probably wind up. I'd like to give a big thank you um, to all of our panel members. I've hugely enjoyed uh, speaking to you today and, and being part of this event and, and, and hearing what you have to say. I'd really also like to thank uh, the people in the audience who've got involved. I'm sorry that I didn't notice all the comments in the, the normal chat as opposed to the Q&A. Um, it's hard when you have both of them going at the same time. Um, but uh, it's been great all the time, uh, great all the same. And um, in, uh, thank you very much, as I say, again, panelists and to the audience. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and do stay for the next session if you possibly can. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Bye.